So I've had a slight delay to start, but wherever you might be, welcome back to the Oxford University Scientific Society in week two of Trinity term. This week, we welcome Professor Scott Aronson from University of Texas at Austin to give a talk on quantum computing. There is no way I can do justice to Professor Aronson's influence on the field by listing out his past achievements, but I can tell you that I very much look forward to the next hour. As always, do type out your questions in the comments section as the talk goes on. We'll collect them for the Q&A session at the very end. With that, I introduce to you our speaker today, Professor Aronson. Okay, well, thank you so much for uh, having me here. I've had so many uh, wonderful visits to uh, Oxford over the years, uh, which was uh, you know, a place uh, very involved in uh, the, the birth of quantum computing um um, um um decades ago and uh so uh you know uh, uh today i'm happy that i can at least visit virtually uh and uh you know um i i decided that that uh um, um the oxford scientific society you know deserved something uh a little bit you know more, more special than my usual can talk so i i uh made uh, uh, some handwritten notes for this talk. Uh, I'm going to try it as an experiment. Uh, I hope I hope you like it. Okay, so uh, what I would like to tell you about uh, is, uh, you know, something that, that's been in the news um, uh, uh, um, uh, a lot uh, in, in, in recent years, uh, which is uh, this milestone called quantum supremacy. And uh, I want to tell you uh, something about what it means and doesn't mean. Okay, so uh, in order to do that, first I have to tell you something about you know what is a quantum computer, uh, and um, uh, the the good news is that I can do that with uh, very little physics, um, less than you might expect, uh, because uh, quantum mechanics at its core uh, is really just a certain generalization of the rules of probability. It is almost like uh, an operating system that uh, the rest of physics runs on as application programs. Okay, but you can uh, understand the, that operating system to to a great extent uh, uh, without needing to understand the applications. You know, you can uh, like uh, the behavior of electrons and photons and so forth. You can uh, learn about that later. Okay, so let's start with uh, what is a classical computer. Let's say a deterministic classical computer, uh, you know, one that never makes any random choices. And uh, you could say uh, at, a, at a high enough level, you know, at the level that will be relevant for me here, uh, it is very simple to understand. Uh, it is just a some, some machine, uh, you know, which we will think about abstractly as being made up of bits. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and if we're computer scientists, then, you know, we don't care that much, you know, how these bits are physically realized, you know, whether they're uh, as uh, uh, voltages or, um, um, you know, uh, um, um, uh, 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 how, how they're realized in transistors, you know, we just care how they behave. So we can think of the state of a classical computer as a string of n bits, x1 up to xn. And so, uh, uh, of course, you know, the, the computer then has two to the n power possible states. Okay, so there's already this exponentiality in classical computers, but it's only sort of in the, the possibilities. Right? Of course, really, the computer is in one state or the other one. And we can manipulate the state. Uh, we can transform it uh, using uh, simple operations that will act on only a few bits at a time. Um, um, and that will apply some Boolean logic to them. Like, for example, we could replace the first bit by the Boolean AND of the third and the fourth bits. Okay, this is called a, a logic gate. You know, and this is sort of the, the uh, uh, building block of, uh, of our uh, computers, the ones that we're all using right now uh, at, at the hardware level. Okay, but now, uh, even before we come to quantum computers, uh, there's already uh, uh, something uh, um, um, intermediate, something you know maybe more interesting, which is a, a probabilistic computer. Okay, so a classical computer, but one that also has the ability to make random choices. That is uh, to take a bit 
and uh, set it to be zero or one with equal probabilities, right? To make a non-deterministic choice. Okay, now uh, in, in, in our world, uh, uh, it might be that the only source of randomness that is truly fundamental you know, that is not just a matter of uh, 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 our own ignorance, you know, of uh, the, the detailed state of the world uh, is quantum mechanics. Okay, but if a computer were to use quantum mechanics only as a source of uh, random bits, then we would not call that a quantum computer, right? Because that's just a, a, a sort of a too, too, um, uh, too too limited of a use of, of quantum mechanics okay but uh, uh, but we, we can consider a computer that uh, you know has uh, access to some true random numbers and uh, uh, you know again uh, a computer that has n bits uh, in its memory uh, and now something interesting happens which is uh, if I want to describe the state of that computer, uh, you know, and I don't know the exact random choices uh, that were made, then I will in general have to describe the state by a probability distribution. Okay, so, so that is, I, you know, in general, the best I could do is uh, for each of the two to the n power possible uh, 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 contents of the computer's memory, I could write down a probability. That, uh, that, 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 that the memory does have those contents. Okay, so I would get a distribution, uh, call it D, uh, which is really a vector. Okay, it is a list of two to the N probabilities, two to the N real numbers. Um, so already in, in, in classical computing, you know, uh, uh, theoretical computer scientists were very used to dealing with exponentiality, right? The, exponentiality of, of, of probabilities. Okay, but you could say, well, uh, but, but, but all of this is just semantics, right? Because uh, really, you know, if you were to look at your probabilistic computer, you would find that each bit is either zero or it's one, right? You, you never see a bit being half zero and half one. Okay, so, so really uh, the, the computer is just in one of these two to the n states and the whole language of probability theory is just a way to encapsulate our own ignorance of what is going on. So you could say that this, this exponentially large distribution, you know, is not really out there in the world. You know, it is just in our heads. Okay? But, you know, be that as it may, uh, if we do represent our knowledge of, of the computer by this exponentially large distribution, then, you know, we can, we can think about how we would update our knowledge. You know, once we know that something uh, that, that the computer has uh, has done something, has uh, taken a step, has changed its state, and in general, this vector of probabilities can then change to a new vector, and the way it does that is via the rules of probability theory, which basically tell us that we can uh, take this vector and apply a linear transformation to it to get a new vector, as long as that linear transformation always maps uh, uh, um, uh, a, a one probability vector to another one. So in other words, as long as it ensures that the probabilities will always add up to one, okay? And a uh, linear transformation that does that is called a stochastic transformation. Okay, so now if you understood all of that, then I am ready to tell you what a quantum computer is. Okay, so a quantum computer uh, is um, uh, um, um, uh, at some level almost the same thing as the classical uh, probabilistic computer, except that instead of a vector of two to the n real numbers, you know, namely the probabilities, you know, one for each possible uh, n bit string, uh, now we have a vector of two to the n complex numbers. Uh, which are called amplitudes, okay? And here I am just uh, with these angle brackets here, uh, which are called Dirac kets. I'm just using the notation that the physicists like to use uh, for vectors. Okay, so we could say that I have a quantum state uh, of my computer, which you know we uh, uh, is traditionally denoted with the Greek letter psi. And um, it is, as we would say, a superposition uh, over 
uh, every possible string of, of n bits, okay, where each string uh, gets some amplitude, that is this uh, alpha sub x. Okay, so each possible string gets an amplitude. Uh, and, and so the state of our computer is given by this vector of two to the n power amplitudes. Where here um, n is the number of bits, or you know, in the quantum setting, uh, we call them quantum bits or qubits. Okay, a, a qubit is just a bit that can uh, have some amplitude for being zero and some other amplitude for being one. So it can be in a superposition of the zero state and the one state. Okay, and uh, the amplitudes uh, have to be normalized. Uh, which means that if I add up the squares of the absolute values of all of these complex numbers, uh, then I have to get one. Okay, and uh, so we could say that this psi, this quantum state, what it really is, is a two to the n dimensional uh, unit vector of complex numbers. Okay, and this is the central thing that quantum mechanics says about the world, right? That the way to describe you know, a physical system uh, or the state of a physical system is using these vectors of amplitudes, uh, these vectors of complex numbers, uh, one for each possible configuration uh, that you could see uh, your system in. Okay, so, uh, um, you know, now, now I, but I, I haven't really told you what this means, right? I mean, now I, I've told you, uh, you know, this is, this is the, the, the core of quantum mechanics. Right. Everything else, you know, you'll ever hear about quantum mechanics is just different uh, uh, applications and implications of this one change uh, uh, that we're making to the rules of probability. Okay, that we are replacing probabilities uh, by these complex numbers, uh, the, these these amplitudes. Um, uh, you know, in 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 everyday life, you would never talk about a negative thirty percent chance of something happening much less, you know, an I percent chance or, you know, a complex number chance. But in, in quantum mechanics, we, we use these, the, these complex numbers, uh, which are going to be very closely related to probabilities, uh, but which are not probabilities. Okay, so, uh, so, so, so now how, how does this uh, ab rather abstract picture of, uh, you know, these vectors of amplitudes, how does it connect to what we can actually do or, or observe? Uh, so if you are to look at your quantum state and, and sort of ask it, you know, uh, like make a measurement and say, what string do I have? Then just like in the case of classical probability, you know, you are not going to see this whole vector, right? You never directly see an amplitude, okay? Uh, all you're going to see is some particular string that is for each qubit that you measure, to ask it whether it is zero or one, you know, it will tell you one or the other. It will tell you that it's zero or that it's one. And the rule is that you will see a string of bits X with probability equal to the squared absolute value of the amplitude of X. Amazing, you know, this is, this is why these, these squares had to add up to one so that the probabilities would. And, and furthermore, once you look, once you make a measurement, then famously the quantum state collapses to whichever outcome you saw. Okay, so if you make a measurement and you see that the, uh, let's say some qubit is zero, uh, then you know, nature has made up its mind that that qubit shall be zero. If you look again, nothing having happened in the meantime, then that qubit will still be zero. You know, and all of the other uh, uh, information about the amplitudes is now gone. It's uh, uh, inaccessible to you forever. Okay, uh, so you know, uh, well then, you know, uh, uh, why is this not just a, a, fa a fancy language for saying, well, you know, we don't know uh, whether the, our bits are zeros or ones, and then we look at them, and then we do know, All right? Well, uh, the reason it's more interesting than that is that you can do other things to a quantum state besides just measuring it. In particular you can apply uh, what is called a unitary transformation. Okay? And this is the quantum version of a, a stochastic transformation uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, it is just any linear transformation 
of the vector of amplitudes uh, that preserves uh, the 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 uh, property that that the probabilities add up to one. Okay, so uh, so any uh, uh, um, a linear transformation that maps unit vectors to unit vectors, and this is called a a, a unitary transformation. Okay, uh, now this uh, uh, these unitary transformations can produce uh, what's called interference of amplitudes, where, for example, a positive and a negative amplitude would cancel each other out and produce a, 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 a sum of zero. Now, this is sort of the central uh, phenomenon of quantum mechanics. Okay, this is the, the, this interference is the central effect that sort of tells us that uh, we are dealing with a quantum system or tells us that the world is quantum mechanical uh, to begin with, you know, that these amplitudes were really there. Okay, so, uh, you know, a very simple, here's a very simple example. Uh, I could have a, a vector of amplitudes, uh, like a, a one over root two, one over root two. Okay, so this is called uh, an equal superposition of the zero state and the one state. Uh, um, uh, you know, th this component representing the amplitude of zero, this component representing the amplitude of one. I could then take that superposition, that vector of amplitudes, and apply to it uh, some two by two unitary matrix, such as this matrix right here, uh, which uh, basically just corresponds to a, a 45 degree counterclockwise rotation in the plane. So uh, uh, if I think of uh, my, my original vector as pointing like this, then it's just going to rotate my vector by 45 degrees and give me this vector here, zero comma one. So, uh, uh, which, which means now my qubit is definitely uh, uh, in the state of one, okay? And it has zero amplitude for being in the state zero. So uh, what has happened here? Well, um, uh, uh, you know, if you think about it, uh, uh, you know, there, like there, there were contributions uh, to the amplitude of the state zero, okay? But one of those ampli one of those contributions was one over root two times one over root two, so it was positive. Uh, the other contribution to the amplitude of the state zero was minus one over root two times one over root two, so it was negative. Okay? And those two contributions canceled each other out, producing a total uh, 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 amplitude of zero uh, uh, on the state zero. So, uh, so there were two ways for you know some uh, an event to happen, but uh, because their amplitudes had opposite signs, they canceled each other out, and that event never happened at all. Okay, uh, this is quantum interference. Okay, the famous experiment that that illustrates you know this uh, as as part of the nature of the world is the double slit experiment. Uh, Richard Feynman used to say that all of quantum mechanics is contained in this one experiment. Uh, and this is the thing where you shoot a particle, like a photon, so let's say just one of them at a time, at a screen with two small slits in it. And then you look at where the photon ends up on a second screen behind it. And um, what you find is, well, first of all, the result is probabilistic. You know, so you could repeat uh, with exactly the same initial conditions, and see sometimes the photon will land in one spot and sometimes in another spot. Okay, now that by itself is not the surprising part. The surprising part is, uh, um, uh, uh, is, is the way we have to calculate the probabilities. Okay, so uh, what, what we find is that there are certain spots on the second screen where the photon just never wants to appear. You know, it, it, it just doesn't appear there. Uh, and yet, if we closed one of the slits, then the photon could appear in those spots. Okay, so to say that again, by decreasing the number of paths that the photon could take to get to a certain spot, we can increase the chance that it gets to that spot. Okay, this is the part that violates the rules of conventional probability theory. Uh, uh, but it is very easy to explain once we understand that uh, um, that the world is quantum mechanical and that uh, 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 the photon can have a superposition with some amplitude uh, to go this way and some other amplitude to go this way. And then what can happen is that if one of the uh, paths 
uh, leading the photon to this spot has a positive amplitude, say alpha, and the other path leading there has a negative amplitude, say uh, minus alpha, then these two uh, amplitudes can cancel each other out, producing a total amplitude of zero. Whereas if I closed one of the slits, now the amplitude is alpha or it's minus alpha, and in either case, uh, its squared absolute value is, uh, is now a positive number, and, and now, uh, now the photon can appear there. Okay, so um, now, you know, this has tremendous philosophical implications, you know, ones that uh, uh, people have been arguing about for, uh, for a century now, okay? But uh, 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 for, for, for this talk, you know, the, the, the main one is that because of the phenomenon of interference, you know, because these amplitudes, uh, these two to the n amplitudes, you know, representing the possible states of our n qubits can actually interfere. They can cancel each other out. Uh, we, we don't have the option of saying that, well, before we looked, our system, you know, our, 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 our bits were, 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 were really in one, you know, uh, uh, definite state of zero or one, right? That they were uh, that they were really some particular string. Uh, no, we have to keep track of this entire vector of amplitudes uh, because you know even though we will never see the amplitudes, uh, we will need them to calculate the probabilities of the various uh, uh, possible strings of zeros and ones that we will see uh, when we look. Okay, and so this seems to force us to uh, uh, admit. That you know that that this entire vector of uh, an exponential number of amplitudes was you know in some sense really there. It was out there in the world. It was not just uh, in our heads. Uh, and you know, and this is uh, a staggering claim about reality. I think it took uh, uh, many decades for you know for it to sink into people. You know just how staggering it, it was, even though. Uh, Schrodinger, uh, you know, already uh, noted it in his uh, original uh, paper on wave mechanics in 1926. Uh, you know, what this exponentiality means is that, you know, just to keep track of the state of, let's say, a thousand particles that are interacting with each other, uh, it seems that, that nature has to have some scratch paper that we never directly see. And on that scratch paper, it has to write Two to the, uh, a list of two to the thousand power complex numbers, okay, two to the thousand power parameters, which uh, uh, um, uh, happens to be much, much more than the number of subatomic particles in the entire observable universe, you know, that, which is only about 10 to the 85 power. Okay, so two to the thousand complex numbers, you know, that in some sense are really there, or, you know, at least are are needed to uh, describe the state of the system, to predict the uh, uh, probabilities of the results that we will see when we look. And whenever anything is done to those thousand uh, particles, then uh, we're saying that nature has to cross off all of those two to the thousand complex numbers and replace them by new complex numbers. Okay, so that is a staggering amount of work for nature to be going to, you know, just to uh, 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 sort of produce the world, you know, to sort of do the computations that that underlie the world, you know, it is much, much more than than even you know the the the, the already enormous uh, amount that 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 one might have thought uh, if one didn't know about quantum mechanics. So. Um, you know, uh, uh, chemists and physicists have known about this exponentiality uh, for uh, uh, a long time, but they've known it mostly as a practical problem. That if you are trying to simulate quantum mechanics with a conventional computer, you know, to learn about the behavior of some uh, molecule or uh, some material, then you know you need to keep track of these exponentially many parameters, and you know you can often invent uh, clever shortcuts. Uh, that will avoid it, but but in general, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, you might need a gigantic supercomputer, you know, just to simulate a very small molecule, and and indeed that's exactly what people do today. They use some of the most powerful computers on the planet to try to 
simulate quantum mechanics. And, you know, there are uh, severe limits to what they can do uh, even then. Okay, so uh, it was not until the early 1980s that a few physicists, uh, most famously uh, Richard Feynman and uh, Oxford's uh, David Deutsch, uh, had the uh, remarkable uh, uh, idea that if nature is giving us this computational lemon, uh, why don't we make lemonade out of it? Uh, or in other words, why don't we build computers uh, that themselves would be made of qubits? Uh, that themselves would uh, be able to take advantage of this uh, exponential uh, uh, proliferation of amplitudes, uh, of interference uh, among all of those amplitudes. Um, you know, of course, uh, they face the question, supposing you built such a computer, what would it be good for? And they didn't really have an answer to that question other than, well, it would be good for simulating quantum mechanics itself. Uh, which, which, you know, is indeed a, a huge application, maybe still today the most important application uh, that we know. Okay? But it, it took uh, another decade or so before um, um, uh, anyone, dis uh, for, 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 for people to really figure out uh, what other tasks uh, a quantum computer could be useful for. And, and uh, I will uh, say something about that later. Okay, but uh, what this talk is, is mainly about is uh, this milestone uh, that was achieved or uh, uh, claimed to be achieved uh, ju uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, shortly before uh, uh, COVID shut down the world. And uh, this is uh, what's called quantum supremacy. Uh, now, this is a term uh, that was coined by uh, uh, um, the physicist John Preskill in 2012. Uh, not everyone likes the term, but it's it's sort of stuck, so I will uh, uh, use it in, in this talk. And uh, what, what Preskill uh, was referring to was uh, just the, the first uh, actual experiments that would convincingly uh, exploit this exponentiality uh, in amplitudes, uh, you know, that is uh, inherent to, to quantum mechanics in order to actually solve some well-defined computational problem, uh, so some you know benchmark problem, and and actually solve it much faster than we know how to solve the same problem with any existing classical computer. Okay, so you know for uh, the context is for 25 years now, you know there have been uh, small-scale experimental demonstrations of quantum computers. Uh, for for a long time, they involve just uh, two or three qubits, um, so you know superpositions of involving four amplitudes or eight amplitudes. You know, and these were interesting uh, proofs of concept. You know, interesting uh, uh, experimental systems, but you know they were not doing anything that uh, your smartphone, you know, would break the slightest sweat uh, to simulate. Okay, they were not outperforming a classical computer. Um, uh, you know, if you want to outperform a classical computer, then uh, uh, what it uh, it seems is that at, at the least you, you would want maybe about 50 qubits, because uh, then, you know, a classical simulation uh, might take two to the 50th power time. Uh, you know, now now that 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 is causing two, two to the 50th power uh, would cause, you know, the biggest uh, supercomputers now on Earth uh, to uh, uh, at least to break a sweat. Okay, so uh, so 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 quantum supremacy, uh, uh, you know, you should think of as as um, uh, a, a targeting, you know, a, a roughly that scale of of, of problems. Now, uh, you may you may notice that uh, I didn't say anything about solving a useful problem. Okay, so that is not part of this uh, th this milestone. Uh, you know, the 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 problem uh, that the quantum computer uh, uh, is solving could be a completely useless and contrived benchmark. Uh, that is fine, uh, just, you know, as long as uh, it is mathematically well-defined uh, so that, you know, we can judge whether the, whether the quantum computer has, succeed, has succeeded or failed uh, at the task. Okay, and, um, you know, you should think of, uh, you know, the Wright brothers' airplane, let's say, or uh, uh, Enrico Fermi's, um, nuclear chain reaction, right? These were not useful in and of themselves. You know, they were built in order to prove a point, you know, that a 
a uh, certain technology uh, can work or you know can give you an advantage over what you could have done without it okay so uh, um, uh, uh, now you know the question becomes uh, how should we actually achieve quantum supremacy what would a convincing demonstration of quantum supremacy uh, uh, consist of now since the mid 1990s you know we have known uh, a gold standard uh, for a uh, a convincing quantum supremacy demonstration. And this is the famous algorithm of Peter Shore, a, a Shore's algorithm for factoring numbers. Uh, and this was the discovery in the mid 90s that really made the wider world excited about quantum computing uh, in the first place, or that sort of put it on the wider intellectual map. Okay, what Shore discovered was that if you built a full uh, programmable uh, quantum computer, you know, and you had complete control over, let's say, thousands or, uh, 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 of, of qubits, then uh, you could, uh, um, there is an algorithm, you know, that would exploit this uh, interference that, that I talked about before to find the prime factors of a composite number uh, very, very quickly. In particular, you could factor uh, an n bit number, an n digit number, in a number of steps that uh, scales only about like n squared. Okay, whereas uh, the best known classical algorithm for factoring uh, uses a number of steps that scales exponentially, exponentially with the cube root of n, uh, uh, to be precise. Uh, so this is an exponential speed up over the best known classical algorithm. And not only that, it's a speed up that actually matters uh, enormously because for better or worse, uh, most of the public key encryption that we currently use to protect the internet. Uh, so, you know, the encryption that is used whenever you, uh, you, you know, use your web browser and there is a padlock icon and there is HTTPS and, you know, you are sending your credit card number uh, 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 over the web. The, 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 the encryption is based on the belief that factoring and a few other closely related problems in number theory uh, are hard, are, 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 are you know, take an astronomical amount of time to solve. Uh, what Shor showed is that once we can build uh, fully programmable quantum computers, then that is no longer true. Then all of that existing encryption uh, is broken. Okay, now uh, uh, I should clarify that you know not, not all possible encryption would be broken, and in fact there is a, 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 a big move today to try to uh, shift people to uh, uh, different encryption systems that we believe to be quantum resistant. Okay, and you know we already have good candidates for that. Uh, it's just that those are not the systems that are widely used today. Okay, so. Uh, but now, uh, for the purpose of quantum supremacy, uh, what's relevant is that, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, it, it, um, 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 not only is, th is this, you know, a very dramatic demonstration of the power of a quantum computer, you know, to, to quickly find factors, you know, but once the factors have been found, it is very, very easy for any skeptic to go and check. Right, they can multiply the factors together. You know, see that they work. Uh, there were even known algorithms to check that the factors are really prime. Okay, so, uh, uh, so 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 it's easy to verify. You know, that the quantum computer did what it was supposed to do. Okay, so this, you know, if you could demonstrate Shor's algorithm to factor, say, a two thousand digit number, then you know there would be very little arguing about it. You know, like you would. You know, uh, 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 um, you know, um, 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 clearly uh, quantum supremacy has has then been achieved. Okay, but you know there are also a couple of drawbacks. Now, the the, the main practical drawback is that we are nowhere close to building the kind of quantum computer that would be able to run Shor's algorithm and and get an advantage from it. Uh, so. Um, uh, uh, it seems that, you know, if you want to uh, run Shor's algorithm with, let's say, thousands of qubits, uh, you're going to need to protect the qubits from interaction with their environment. That's going to require something called quantum error correction or quantum fault tolerance. 
And as soon as you need that, it tends to blow up the number of qubits that you need by factors of thousands, okay? uh, at least using any of the error correction methods uh, that we know today. Uh, so at that point, you're talking about a quantum computer with millions or even hundreds of millions of qubits. You know, it might, uh, uh, you might need equipment that fills a building. You know, it might need days or weeks to do the factoring. So maybe the uh, NSA or the GCHQ, you know, might, you know, it might be worth it for them to, to actually build this. But uh, I certainly don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Okay. Uh, now, a, a second, a more theoretical issue is that no one actually knows whether the prime factorization problem is hard for classical computers. Uh, you know, we, we believe it enough that we base our, uh, our, our internet commerce on, 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 on that belief. But, you know, as far as um, computer science is concerned, uh, you know, if there were a fast classical uh, uh, algorithm for, for factoring, it wouldn't really have any dramatic consequences that we know of for anything else, right? So, you know, and, and the, there, are, there are mathematicians who believe that, that, that such an algorithm, you know, plausibly exists. And, you know, if, and, and if it does, then, then Shor's algorithm would not be getting an exponential speed up uh, over what you could do with a classical computer. Okay, so, um, 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 a decade ago, um, I and others were, were thinking about these issues and uh, uh, there's some sort of um, ideas uh, coalesced together and, and we ended up proposing uh, a much more direct route to uh, achieve quantum supremacy uh, than, you know, via, say, a full quantum computer uh, running Shor's algorithm. And uh, the route that we proposed uh, was to look at uh, what are called sampling problems. These are problems where uh, the, uh, uh, there is not a single right answer as there is for factoring. Okay, the desired answer is a sample from a probability distribution uh, over uh, uh, n-bit strings. Okay, and our goal is, was just to find some distribution uh, over strings that is easy to generate a sample from with a quantum computer hard to generate a sample from with a classical computer, okay? And now the point is that once you uh, uh, change the goal in this way, then uh, uh, you, you, you find uh, uh, two, two things that are, that, are, that, are, that, 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 are, that are really nice. The first is that, um, uh, well, uh, uh, um, there, are, there are such distributions that could be sampled even by very rudimentary quantum computers. Okay, so instead of needing you know, millions of qubits and uh, full error correction and so forth, uh, there are probability distributions that plausibly you know, one could sample from even using only 50 or 100 noisy qubits. Okay, and now you're, you know, the, the experimentalists become you know, much more uh, optimistic that well, you know, maybe we can actually do this, you know, in, you know, in a matter of years uh, uh, rather than decades. Um, now, the second thing is that uh, we could give extremely strong uh, theoretical evidence that uh, there is not going to be a fast classical algorithm to do the same thing. Okay? Uh, uh, you know, it's still not a proof, right? We, we just don't know how to prove these sorts of statements in, in theoretical computer science. But what we can show is that if there were a fast method for a classical computer to generate samples from these same distributions, then rather dramatic things would happen uh, to uh, the uh, hierarchy of computational complexity theory. Uh, an example is uh, something called the collapse of the polynomial hierarchy. Uh, I'm not going to explain what that means, but uh, if you've heard of the P versus NP problem, uh, you know, the collapse of the polynomial hierarchy would be uh, uh, almost as dramatic, I would say, as uh, a proof that P equaled NP. Okay? It uh, wouldn't have quite as many uh, uh, consequences for, uh, for the real world, but you know, uh, uh, 
uh, in the, the, uh, the theoretical world of, of computer science, it would be almost as surprising. Uh, and you know, we could, we could give examples of quantumly sampleable distributions where if you could sample them classically using an amount of time that was polynomial, there's a number of steps that grew like n, you know, the number of bits raised to some fixed power, then uh, the polynomial hierarchy uh, provably would collapse. Uh, and this is, you know, a, uh, close to the, the strongest evidence that a problem is hard that, uh, that one hopes for in the current state of theoretical computer science. Uh, now, uh, uh, admittedly, once you introduce noise into the experiment, you introduce uh, uh, all the realistic issues like uh, uh, photons getting lost, uh, you know, your devices being not calibrated, then uh, it becomes harder to say, well, could a classical computer spoof the noisy uh, version of the experiment? Then uh, uh, if you want that to be hard too, then you have to make some, uh, uh, you have to stick your neck out further, make some stronger conjectures about what is hard for, for classical computers. Okay, but those stronger conjectures uh, look very plausible to us as well. Okay, so an example of, uh, uh, of such a proposal was uh, uh, what uh, my student Alex Arkhipov and I called boson sampling. Uh, this is where you just generate some photons, you send them through a sequence of uh, beam splitters, uh, and then you just measure uh, where all of the photons ended up. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's all you do. You know, the task is just to generate a sample from you know, what quantum mechanics predicted predicts would be the distribution over you know how many photons would uh, would appear in each in each output port uh, and and now the point is you know there are uh, and, and 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 the beam splitters can just be chosen randomly okay so so you could think of it as you are doing a random sequence of operations to your quantum state of oh, let's say 50 or 100 photons uh, and, and now there are, there is an exponential number of possible outputs. Okay, so, uh, you know, you could see three photons here, zero photons here, five photons there, or you could see two there, one here, and, and, and so forth. Okay, so, so uh, there's a combinatorial explosion of possible output states. You know, you'll probably never see the same output twice in the whole, uh, no matter how often you, you run your experiment. Uh, but uh, uh, not all of the outputs are equally likely. And this is really the crucial point. Okay? Uh, e the amplitude for each output is, is a sum of exponentially many contributions. Uh, and those contributions will look more or less random, you know, just like random complex, you know, uh, uh, let's say uh, um, uh, um, um, random, random complex numbers with, with, a, with a mean of zero. And so, you know, the, 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 the complex numbers uh, will mostly cancel each other out because, you know, they're just pointing in every uh, possible direction in the complex plane. But the cancellation will not be perfect. There will still be a little residue that's left over. Uh, and that will determine the probability that you see this particular state, uh, the size of that residue. Okay, And the, the, the residue that's left over after all this cancellation will be a little bit bigger for some of the outputs than it will be for others, you know, just randomly. Okay, but now the point is, um, if we've got a powerful enough classical computer, and if the classical computer knows the complete sequence of operations that the quantum computer was applying, then it can simulate this entire setup, and it could predict which outcomes are likelier than others. Okay, so, so now when we run the, the actual uh, experiment and we see the, uh, you know, even just a small number of outputs, uh, we can do statistics on them. We can say, are we preferentially seeing the outputs that were predicted by our classical computer to be the more likely ones? Okay, and that is exactly what is done in these quantum supremacy experiments. Okay, so this brings me to uh, the actual experiments uh, that were announced over the past couple of years. Okay, so the first uh, uh, announcement of quantum supremacy was by uh, the group of Google uh, in their lab in Santa Barbara 
in uh, fall of 2019. Uh, so they had been working on this uh, uh, for about five years. And um, two years ago, uh, they announced that um, you know they or they you know they they published a paper uh, in, um, uh, in 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 Nature uh, announcing that um, they believed they had done it. They built what they did was that they built a programmable chip uh, with uh, um, fifty three qubits. They uh, they used a technology called superconducting qubits. Um, their, their chip is called Sycamore. If you're wondering why 53 qubits, well, apparently they built 54, and uh, one of them didn't work. Okay, but they're, you know, arranged uh, roughly in a rectangular grid uh, on the chip, where you know each qubit can talk to its neighbors. Uh, the chip is placed into a dilution refrigerator, which, uh, if you see a picture of one, it looks kind of like an upside-down wedding cake, and it's cooled uh, to about 10 millikelvin just slightly above absolute zero. That is what you need to cause the chip to superconduct, uh, which, which is what allows these uh, bits, these currents uh, flowing around these, these little wires to behave as qubits as all, uh, at all, to behave quantum mechanically. Okay? Uh, even then, even at this ultra low temperature, uh, you're still only maintaining a quantum superposition state for a very short time, for about 40 microseconds. Okay, but uh, that is enough to already do an interesting quantum computation uh, on the qubit. So what they do is within that time, they're able to do about a thousand operations on the 53 qubits, uh, each one acting on, on one or two of the qubits. But yeah, the operations are arranged into uh, 20 layers. Uh, now, this entire uh, um, uh, chip was specifically designed just to demonstrate quantum supremacy, you know, along the lines that we had proposed uh, in 2011 or so, uh, uh, based, based on sampling problems. Uh, by sampling from some probability distribution over, in this case, strings of 53 bits, uh, where, you know, the idea is that this chip can very quickly generate a sample from that distribution, you know, on demand, um, you know, in 40 microseconds. But if you uh, wanted to sample from that same distribution with a classical computer, then the best known algorithms might need uh, a number of steps that's like 2 to the 53 power, which is about 9 quadrillion. Okay, so that that is the... Uh, separation that they're going for okay uh, so so they so they actually built all of this uh, you know they had a team of uh, 75 people um, you know I think it was um, um, you know a hundred million dollars or so uh, uh, and you know they were able to build a chip where you know there is a lot of noise in the system right because the qubits are not error corrected okay so uh, so what you see each time you take a sample, is like 99.8% just uniformly random noise, uh, just you know, just completely random zeros and ones, which of course you would not have needed a quantum computer to generate, you know, which is which is not interesting. Okay, but you have point at like the level of 0.2%, you have a signal, you have a bias where some output strings are a little bit likelier than others, and now because the chip is so fast, in three minutes, they were able to take several million uh, independent samples. And that is enough to extract a signal from, from that level of noise. Uh, so they applied a statistical test to the uh, millions of samples that they collected, uh, which they called the linear cross entropy benchmark, or LXEB. It just involves checking a certain inequality you know, involving the ideal probabilities of the samples that were observed. In particular, just summing up all of those probabilities and checking whether or not the sum exceeds a certain threshold. Where, uh, you know, I've, I've uh, underlined this number here. Uh, uh, if, you know, you just had a, uh, uh, if you were just picking samples randomly with no quantum computer at all, then this number should be one. If you had a perfect quantum computer with no noise, 
then this number should be two, okay? But if this number is anything above one, then that is the signal that, you know, you were, uh, 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 you know, that, that, that quantum interference was actually happening. Was, bo was boosting the probabilities of, of certain uh, uh, outputs in a way that we think is hard to simulate with a classical computer, okay? And, uh, you know, I, I, as, as you can see, they, they, uh, they, they find that signal. Okay, now uh, um, my students, uh, Li Ji Chen, uh, Sam Gunn and I uh, uh, had given theoretical evidence that uh, uh, under reasonable assumptions, you know, any classical algorithm even that just simply spoofs this test, you know, the test that Google applied uh, to its outputs, you know, should need uh, uh, an amount of time that increases exponentially with the number of qubits. You know, at least if, if, if there is a faster classical way to spoof the results, then that would have some surprising implications. Okay, now uh, just uh, five months ago, uh, the group of uh, um, um, Chao Yang Lu uh, and Jian Wei Pan in Hefei, China, uh, uh, announced a second uh, uh, achievement of quantum supremacy. And, and that one was using a completely different hardware platform. I uh, was using our original proposal uh, of boson sampling. Uh, so they literally just built a gigantic optical table uh, uh, into which you know, they could pass uh, an average of 50 photons uh, through a network of hundreds of beam splitters and uh, then measure where the photons end up. So, you know, they have uh, about 10 to the 30th power possible output states, which is, you know, more than in Google's experiment, which was like 10 to the 16th power. Um, if, there, if none of the photons were lost, if the experiment were, were really done perfectly, then we expect that, you know, it would take something like two to the 50th steps to uh, spoof the, the results of the experiment using a classical computer. Uh, there is still a, a debate ongoing about uh, this experiment, uh, which has to do with, you know, partly with the fact that uh, a large fraction of the photons get lost uh, in the beam splitter network and are never detected. It is possible that the photon losses and other imperfections could allow a, a shortcut to simulating the experiment with a classical computer, you know, could 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 uh, uh, which could then uh, negate uh, the claim of quantum supremacy. Uh, we don't really know yet. Uh, people are still working on it, but at any rate, they've you know outperformed any uh, a, a, any of the classical simulations that that they or others have have so far been able to find. Okay, so what I want to do. Um, in the remaining time is mostly, you know, briefly uh, describe some of the objections to these quantum, to these sampling-based quantum supremacy experiments uh, that, that tend to recur and, and make some comments on these objections. I think that some of the objections uh, are more serious than others. Okay, so uh, the first objection is uh, one that uh, um, uh, the mathematician Richard Borchardt's uh, recently uh, offered on, on YouTube, and I, I wrote a blog post responding to it, and he, he sort of parodied quantum supremacy with the example of a teapot. He said, uh, uh, look, if I took a teapot and I just smashed it on the floor, uh, you know, that would uh, achieve supremacy over classical computers for the task of simulating a teapot that is smashed on the floor. But clearly that is not interesting, right? Clearly, uh, uh, you know, it's not interesting to just point to any complicated physical system and say, well, it achieves supremacy at the task of simulating itself. So, you know, why is quantum supremacy anything more interesting than that? Now, my opinion is that this is, is, is just a, a, um, a simple misunderstanding of, of what the, the quantum supremacy experiments are. Okay, with, with the sampling-based quantum supremacy experiments, what you do is you, 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 don't, you don't just point to a, a device like a chip or a beam splitter network and say simulate whatever that does. That is not what we're doing, right? We're saying here is a mathematical specification of a problem to be solved, of a distribution to be sampled. Okay, now it just so happens to be one that is designed with that device in mind, but no matter, right? Once we have specified the distribution, then uh, 
a classical computer, you know, has all of the data that it needs to also generate samples. You know, the quantum computer can generate samples, but logically it could also fail to do so, right? I like to say that uh, in order for something to, in order for a physical object to count as a computer, it has to be at least logically possible for that object to output a wrong answer, right? There has to be some external standard against which you are comparing it, okay? And, and that is true with the quantum supremacy experiments. Um, uh, you know, a, a classical computer can check, can and does check the work of the quantum computer. It is just that it needs exponentially more time to do so. Now that would not be the case with a teapot because with a teapot, a classical computer just would not know the detailed microscopic state of all of the, the atoms in the teapot and the atoms of the air and so forth. Uh, you know, what would be fair would be to ask the, your classical computer to just sample from a probability distribution over all the plausible uh, uh, evolutions of, of a teapot that is uh, uh, dropped to the ground. But that is something that a classical computer can do. Okay, so I don't think that a teapot actually achieves supremacy for that task. You know, there is not a, a, an, an exponential uh, uh, um, 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 advantage, uh, a, a, as you see when you're actually exploiting uh, quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, second response is simply, well, quantum supremacy experiments are not interesting because they are useless. You know, they are only demonstrating a, a speed up, but, but not to solve any problem that, that anyone independently cares about. All right, well, a first response to that is, uh, so what? Uh, you know, uh, we, we uh, uh, said from the beginning, you know, that, uh, you know, this is just to prove a point. And, you know, if someone promised you more than that, well, then, you know, you shouldn't have listened to that person, right? Uh, uh, you know, this is this is a step, you know, in a long road to getting devices that we hope will, you know, uh, ultimately will actually do useful problems. But, you know, it uh, uh, let's um, approach things like scientists. Let's, you know, uh, establish the truth of the or the reality of the phenomenon in question, you know, before we try to uh, make money off of it. Right. Uh, so. Uh, but now, you know, the, uh, recently uh, a second response has emerged. So a few years ago, uh, I realized that these sampling-based quantum supremacy experiments actually do have at least one potential application. Namely, you know, if the experiment works, if you generate samples that pass the statistical test, like this linear cross-entropy benchmark, then... Uh, not only do you have some sort of certification that a quantum computer must have been used to produce those samples, you have uh, some sort of cryptographic guarantee that even a quantum computer could only have produced those samples randomly. Okay, it could not have done so in a secretly deterministic way. We just, you know, we 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 expect that 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 would have uh, uh, been exponentially more difficult. Okay, and, and, and so now you have a sort of cryptographic guarantee of randomness. And now that could be useful for all sorts of applications. Uh, a prominent example being what are called proof of stake cryptocurrencies, uh, such as the next generation uh, Ethereum, uh, where you need to constantly run a lottery to decide who gets to add the next block to your blockchain. Um, and you know, that, so the decision has to be made randomly and everyone has to trust that it really was random because billions of dollars are riding on that or, 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 or pounds. Uh, so, um, uh, um, you know, there, there are many ways that you could imagine getting sort of certifiable randomness, but, you know, these quantum supremacy experiments are one possible way to do that. And uh, uh, Google has actually uh, been, been, been exploring that has been trying to, uh, uh, implement my protocol. Okay, now the third objection is, well, you know, the, the entire point of quantum computers was supposed to be to outperform classical computers in asymptotic scaling behavior. That is to solve problems with polynomial scaling, you know, in N that classically would have required exponential scaling with N. 
Okay, but you know, there's something fishy about the quantum supremacy experiments, the, the, or the, at least the existing ones, because they are not scalable, right? Because the qubits are not error corrected, uh, we don't expect to be able to scale these experiments beyond, let's say, a few hundred qubits at the most. Okay, so 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 what is going on with that? You know, and I uh, I admit that this is true, right? We you know we we do not yet have scalable quantum computers. You know, if if we did, we would just run Shor's out al factoring algorithm and and be done with it. Uh, you know, but um, uh, at the same time, you know, I would say to a skeptic, well, can you explain the success of these experiments or the outcomes of these experiments without needing to invoke, you know, the reality of this vector of 10 quadri you know, of, of quadrillions of amplitudes or of two to the 50th amplitudes. Um, if you can't, then I would say that one of the main claims of quantum computation has now been empirically demonstrated. It has now been demonstrated that you can harness this, uh, you know, exponential uh, growth of uh, uh, in the number of amplitudes in order to solve computational problems faster. You know, and it remains to be shown that you can error correct the qubits in order to truly scale to thousands of qubits. But you know, this really was one of the main points at issue, and and to settle that point is a really big deal. Okay, now a fourth response, or sort of fourth objection is, okay, but, but how do we know that these quantum supremacy experiments were really doing something that was hard for a classical computer, right? Maybe they can be simulated classically uh, much faster than the proponents believe. Uh, so my response is, well, that is indeed a, a really big worry. And in fact, uh, short, you know, after Google's quantum supremacy claim came out, uh, there were rebuttals by uh, IBM, which is uh, Google's main competitor in superconducting qubits, uh, which said, well, you know, we don't think Google has achieved quantum supremacy. We could, uh, uh, and they sketched how they could, uh, th they thought that they could simulate the results. Admittedly, though, they were they, using the largest supercomputer currently on the planet, uh, which, is, uh, which is called Summit uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab, and which has 250 petabytes of hard disk space. And their proposal was to just write the entire list of nine quadrillion amplitudes uh, to hard disk, do the simulation that way. And you know, they said it would take uh, maybe, maybe three days. Um, Alibaba had a different way to simulate Google's experiment using what are called uh, tensor networks. Okay, but you know, it's important to realize that even while the classical simulation methods improve, and you know, they've I think it's it's now shown that you know, using a reasonable supercomputer, yes, you could simulate the Google experiment in a matter of days or weeks. Uh, so you know, the, the 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 experiment is still faster, but you know, but this but the uh, the speed up is only by a factor of thousands. It's not by uh, millions or billions. Uh, but on the other hand, the quantum computers are go going to continue to improve extremely rapidly, right? Even, you know, while the classical simulations also improve, right? So the question is, well, you know, who is going to win this race? Well, now the important point is that no classical simulation method is known yet that really breaches the exponential barrier, you know, that sort of, you know, uh, does not have exponential scaling. And, you know, and, and, you know, we've given some theoretical evidence that, that that is unlikely. And as long as that remains the case, then I would say that quantum computers are predictably going to, you know, win this race decisively and do so within, you know, a matter of, of only a few years. You know, it's sort of like the Kasparov versus Deep Blue chess competition, you know, in the 90s. Like if, 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 it's, a, if it's a close fight, you know, in a certain year between the best human and the best computer, then you can reliably predict that you know, a couple of years uh, afterward, it will no longer be a close fight. You know, the computer will just have complete dominance. Uh, and, you know, and that, that's, that's very much the situation with quantum supremacy, unless something happens, unless some new discovery is made that would allow classical computers to breach this exponential barrier. Uh, now, the fifth objection 
is, well, with existing quantum supremacy experiments, um, you know, it, it's actually just as hard for a classical computer to verify the quantum computer's results as it is to simulate those results. And this means that, you know, you, you know if, if you really go completely beyond what a classical computer could, could simulate at all, you know, as a, let's suppose if, if Google had used 100 qubits or 200 qubits instead of only 53 qubits, right? And, you know, if, if they really went completely beyond what a classical computer could do, then they would also be completely beyond what a classical computer could check. So they couldn't even prove that it worked. So, 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 so how do we get to say that this is quantum supremacy? So, you know, the response to that is, well, one, one, what, what, what one does is, you know, one demands that the quantum computer produce its outputs very quickly. Like let's say in a few seconds or a few minutes. And one can then use the biggest supercomputers in the world to verify the results at leisure. You know, the classical computer can take weeks or, or months to do the verification and you can use you know one million parallel processors let's say to help you verify what just the single quantum computer had done so you can demonstrate that there is a large gap in performance uh, in that way uh, having said that uh, yes i think that this is maybe the biggest drawback of the quantum supremacy experiments as they stand one of the biggest open problems in this area is you know uh, uh, how can we get um, uh, a, an experiment that is both realizable, you know, using near-term quantum computers, uh, and that achieves quantum supremacy, and where the results can be easily verified using a classical computer? We don't. There's been some progress on that, but we don't know how to do it yet. Uh, that's a, that's a huge challenge. Okay, now uh, uh, one unfortunate effect of the announcement of quantum supremacy is that it has really turbocharged a lot of the irresponsible hype, you know, that, that, that there's been uh, around quantum computing, you know, and that hype has been there for decades. You know, in fact, uh, uh, one of the main roles of my, my blog for the past 15 years has been to try to counter uh, the, you know, irresponsible hype around, you know, the uh, uh, practical applications of quantum computers, you know, uh, changing everything. But, you know, now quantum supremacy, I think, you know, partly just because of the term, just because of how, you know, awesome it sounds or whatever, it is, it is really kicked the hypesters, you know, into overdrive. And so, you know, they, um, you know, if you read, I would say most popular articles about this field, you know, they will give a very misleading picture of what we expect quantum computers to be able to do, right? And they will say things like, well, unlike a classical computer, which could just try, you know, uh, each possible answer one at a time, a quantum computer could just try every possible answer in parallel, you know, as in this picture here. Uh, and, you know, the, the trouble is they give the impression that then, you know, the quantum computer could just somehow instantly pick the best answer. Now, if this was true, then quantum computers uh, uh, would give speed ups not merely for factoring or, or quantum simulation or a few other special problems, right? They would completely revolutionize uh, optimization and machine learning and, you know, and everything like that. Uh, they could solve the so-called NP-complete problems in polynomial time. Okay, now it is really crucial to understand that we do not expect quantum computers uh, to be able to do that, okay? And, uh, uh, you know, this is not even controversial within the field, uh, but, you know, there is this sort of wall of obfuscation that, you know, prevents this message from getting out to the wider world. But, you know, uh, since, you know, the, this, is, this, is, this is my talk, I can tell you the truth. Okay, the problem is that, well, you know, with, with a quantum computer, yes, you can create an equal superposition over all the possible solutions to your problem even if there were exponentially many of them. That is even an easy thing to do with a quantum computer. Um, but for a computer to be useful, at some point you have to measure it. You have to look at it and see an output. And if you just measured the state, you know, you just measured an equal superposition over all of the answers, not having done anything else, then uh, all you're going to see will be a uniformly random answer. 
you know, and if you just wanted a random answer, you could have picked one yourself with a lot less trouble, right? So the entire hope of getting a speed up from a quantum computer is to exploit the way that the amplitudes, being complex numbers, work differently from probabilities. In particular, it is to exploit interference, right? With every quantum algorithm, you know, like Shor's factoring algorithm and all of the rest, uh, the idea is to choreograph a pattern of interference such that for each wrong answer, each one you don't want to see, uh, some paths leading to it have positive amplitudes and others have negative amplitudes, let's say, so that all, on the whole they cancel each other out. Whereas the amplitudes leading to the correct answer should uh, reinforce each other. Okay? If you can arrange that, then uh, you will see the right answer with a high probability. Right? You know, the quantum supremacy experiments did this in a very crude way, right? With just a, a, a little bit of, you know, uh, destructive and constructive interference. Shor's algorithm would do it in an incredibly well controlled way, concentrating almost all of the amplitude on a tiny subset of the answers. Okay, but this is a very weird ability, right? You know, it is weirder than any science fiction writer would have had the imagination to invent, I think. And uh, it is, you know, nature is giving us this very strange hammer of uh, interference where, you know, we then have to find the special nails that this hammer can hit, right? The, the main way that people go astray in hyping quantum computing is that they ignore all of that, okay? They pretend that a quantum computer is just a general purpose uh, um, uh, um, oracle or, you know, this godlike machine that could speed up anything, okay? And they say, well, quantum computers, you know, are going to revolutionize, you know, industrial optimization problems and deep learning and basically anything that sounds good, right? Where in many cases, you know, those of us in this field, we have no idea what quantum algorithms there actually are that would be able to achieve those speed ups that are promised. And yet, um, you know, uh, um, um, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of venture capital have been, you know, have been raised based on, you know, investors making the, these promises that, you know, I have no idea what they're based on. Okay, so, you know, the known applications of quantum computers, well, you know, maybe, as I said, the most important is maybe simulating uh, uh, quantum mechanics itself, you know, uh, so in order to understand chemical reactions, possibly design new drugs, design uh, uh, new solar cells or materials, high temperature superconductors, uh, you know, we expect big quantum speedups there. It is even possible that we could see some advantages using noisy, uh, non-error corrected quantum or, or only, only partially error corrected quantum computers in the relatively near term. Okay, so, so that's, a, that's an exciting prospect. Secondly, of course, is breaking uh, cryptography uh, where quantum computers do promise in a clear exponential speed up, but not in the near future. That will really require a full error corrected quantum computer. Uh, now, thirdly, for all of these problems like search, optimization, Monte Carlo estimation, you know, so a huge number of industrially relevant problems, machine learning problems. There is a quantum algorithm called Grover's algorithm that can typically solve such problems in about the square root of the number of steps that a classical computer would, would need. So that has an enormous range of applications, um, but it will be a very, very long time, probably even longer than for Shor's algorithm until you could actually see an advantage with Grover's algorithm, okay? Because not only will you need a full error corrected quantum computer, but because the advantage here is more modest, it is square root rather than exponential. You know, the crossover point where you start outperforming a classical computer is then pushed much further into the future. And then fourthly, there are all sorts of quantum algorithms that people have proposed where we don't really know how well they're going to perform in practice and, and where we might need to actually build the quantum computer and try them out before we really know, you know whether these can outperform uh, the best things that we could, we, we could do using classical computers. 
And into this category, I would put uh, what's called adiabatic optimization, also most quantum algorithms for machine learning problems. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and you see huge numbers of confident claims about the revolutionary impacts that quantum computers are going to have based on these algorithms. And almost all of it, you know, uh, the way I would put it is that it is based on an axiom of optimism. It is based on the idea that, well, if, if experts can't prove that there's not a huge quantum speed up to be had there, then you just get to proceed on the assumption that there is such a speed up, you know, and, you know, I, I, I feel like we ought to have a higher standard than that. Okay, so, you know, the, what I'd like to end with is uh, you know what does quantum supremacy mean for our understanding of the world? I guess I uh, promised to say something about that in my abstract. So you know, famously, uh, Hugh Everett in the '50s, and you know, more recently, uh, David Deutsch and others, uh, you know, have forcefully argued that quantum mechanics just seems to logically entail the physical reality of exponentially many parallel universes. This is what's called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. You know, and the, the idea here is that if you just follow the evolution of a quantum state, uh, uh, you know, of, of the vector of amplitudes as it undergoes unitary evolution, you know, there is no obvious place for it to ever stop. You know, even when you make a measurement, you know, and, and uh, traditionally we, we would say that that collapses the state to one outcome or the other, but even, you know, that too could be modeled as just another unitary transformation, another interaction where you be, you yourself would become correlated or entangled with the quantum system that you are measuring. You know, so that is a very simple, parsimonious, you know, elegant picture. Uh, the one issue is that it leads to this view where you know the world is constantly branching into uh, you know different components, each of which has an amplitude. You know, and maybe, you know, we only experience one of the components, but, you know, there would be nothing to make the other components go away or, you know, to make these these parallel worlds, if you like, uh, 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 not exist. Um, so, you know, even after we, you know, if and when we do get truly scalable, practical quantum computers, you know, uh, I expect people to continue to debate about these questions. You know, are there really parallel copies of you where, you know, your life turned out differently or uh, parallel worlds where, where you know, where, 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 where we don't have COVID or where, you know, uh, uh, world events have happened differently. Okay. Uh, but, um, you know, I think if anyone thinks that the world does not provide this computational resource of exponentially many amplitudes, you know, like the ball is is now, you know, given the quantum supremacy experiments, I think the ball was in their court to, to explain uh, how that could be. All right. So with that, uh, uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I apologize for going over time, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. This, this was really, really interesting. And I really appreciated your discussion about when are these things going to be actually available. Um, so I think we can go now for the question. So I have a lot of questions myself, but um, let's give some priority to the audience. So the first question is, so do you envisage that in the future people will have commercial personal quantum computers in the same way that we now have PCs? Um, and will they completely so, sort of supersede classical computers? Uh, I don't. I don't expect that to ever happen, and I will tell you exactly why. Okay, uh, uh, because uh, uh, you know we we you, you don't need a quantum computer to play Angry Birds or to check your email or to do you know ninety nine percent of the things that we that we want to use computers for, and furthermore. You know, when you do need a quantum computer, you know, the wonderful thing is that we now have this internet, right? And so, you know, you can simply make a quantum computer available as a cloud resource, right? And this is the model that, you know, Google and IBM and various startup companies are already pursuing right now, right? Where, you know, you could just submit tasks to, you know, the, uh, uh, 
a quantum computer, you know, for those specialized applications where it could provide you some benefit. And, you know, you, you, uh, you just, you consult it over the internet, right? So, you know, like I, it's always, um, uh, 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 risky to make these predictions, right? I'm aware that, uh, you know, uh, uh, it was predicted, you know, decades ago that there was absolutely no reason why anyone needs a computer in their home, right? And, you know, and that is often ridiculed today as, you know, one of the wrongest predictions in history. But actually, I think if you look at uh, what, you know, Ken Olson, who made that prediction, was actually thinking, you know, he, he, was, he was really thinking about what today we would call the cloud. Right, you know that you could just have the computation be centralized and then have everyone access it through a network, and the world really is moving to that model. So you could say, you know, he was really just ahead of his time, right? And and I think that you know quantum computing for the foreseeable future, it makes by far the most sense to have it be provided as a cloud resource. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, what once once it usefully works at all. Fair yeah. enough. That's, that's a very yeah. interesting thought. Let's, well, let's see what happens in the next 20 years. Yeah. Um, Lance, can you send us the next question? I think we still have time for another one or two questions, perhaps. Um, so this question comes from Arthur from the audience. Um, okay. Says, well, given classical approximation algorithms, readily accessible classical resources, uh, well, enabling a particular runtime, um, error correction, et cetera, et cetera. Would you expect a square root speed up on MP hard optimization problems? To to actually have any practical applications. Yeah, it's it, it's a very good question. Um not not for the near future. No, I mean I would be very surprised to see that in the next few decades, you know. Eventually, possibly. Uh I mean, you know, the the uh the, the, you know, I think it, it, it's a bad bet to sort of, you know, bet uh, against theory, right? The whole point of uh, theoretical computer science is like, if you get an asymptotic advantage, then eventually it's going to win, right? But the, the trouble is just that eventually it could be a long time, okay? So, uh, 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 so I, I, I would not, ex you know, uh, uh, basically, you know, if you look at the recent uh, uh, calculations that have been done by Matthias Troyer and others, you know, they look like the the uh, the the physical requirements to actually get a speed up using Grover's algorithm uh, looks scary, absolutely scary. You know, it looked like you would need a problem involving um, um, you know, many quadrillions of possible solutions before you had a hope. So I would say. Either there has to be a revolution, a revolutionary advance in quantum error correction that would reduce the overhead for it, you know, and that would make Grover's algorithm more practical, or else, you know, we're not going to see an advantage with Grover's algorithm for many decades. But, um, you know, eventually, possibly, yes, we will see it. Do you mind if I follow up with a, a sort of related question? So. Yeah. What is your opinion on the sort of variational hybrid classical quantum algorithms? Do you think yeah. they're actually useful or are they just sort of an excuse to hype up the field? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So first of all, you know, I don't like the term hybrid quantum classical algorithm because people, you know, make a big deal out of it. But in reality, every quantum algorithm is a hybrid quantum classical algorithm. Right. For every, you know, realistic use of a quantum computer in any foreseeable future, you are going to be using a classical computer, you know, to control the quantum computer. Right. And the classical computer will be doing anything that it can do. And the quantum computer will only be doing those things that it has to do. Right. Because, you know, it, to, to use a quantum computer to do classical computation, you know, it's sort of like using the space shuttle to drive around the parking lot, right? It's like, even if it can be done, it is just, it's, 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 it's ridiculously wasteful, okay? Uh, and, 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 you know, millions of times slower. So, uh, um, so, you know, now regarding, you know, variational algorithms, I think that, you know, uh, from, from, from what I can see, they, they show some promise for problems that themselves involve quantum mechanics. So for, you know, chemistry, quantum chemistry problems, uh, you know, and, and, and there they sort of fall under the broader umbrella, perhaps, of 
quantum simulation methods. Uh, you know, I think they show promise there. I have not yet seen a convincing case that the variational methods are going to lead to speed ups for solving purely classical problems. You know, there has been a lot of effort, you know, smart people like my former MIT colleague, Ed Farhi, have, you know, worked on this, uh, uh, trying to show that this, you know, QAOA, this quantum approximate optimization algorithm, uh, could help for optimization problems. But, you know, they, they, I would say that they failed to find convincing evidence of that. The main results that we have about it are negative results. So, you know, it remains an open question, but, you know, I have, I have yet to see the case for where it's going to help with classical problems. Well, thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I am afraid um, my colleagues are telling me that if we go um, beyond eight, um, we might get kicked out by the platform. So I think it's better if we call okay. a stop. So I'm going to let right. Luna uh, uh, well, say the goodbye. Sure. sure. All right, thank you ever so much for your time um, and joining us from across the pond, especially with your handwritten notes, which I'm sure everyone appreciated. And of course, thank you, Carlos, for um, moderating the Q&A session that just happened. Um, thank you goes out to our committee members, as well as everyone joining us in the audience today. Next Monday evening, we'll be hearing from Oxford's own Professor Parrington about how culture transforms the human brain. Enjoy the rest of your evening and hope to see you then. Goodbye.